Greetings and salutations. This is Kung Pao. Enter the minute, minute four. The opening frame. A close-up on Master Pain after he blinks in surprise. There is a struggle, revealing that despite his tiny size, the Chosen One is capable of holding his own against the strength of a fully grown adult. Master Pain exclaims as the Chosen One proceeds to kick him in the face several times before drawing back the dagger for another strike. The Chosen One somersaults out of the way of the dagger and then does a flip to kick one of the minions, knocking him against the wall, before spinning in the air and landing deftly at his feet and striking an action pose. Master Pain orders his minions to kill it! The other minion proceeds to chase the baby as it backflips off the wall, letting the minion face plant into it, dropping him to the ground. The Chosen One, spinning through the air, lands on possibly the first minion who was standing, causing him to fly around in confusion before finally crumbling to the floor, allowing the Chosen One to roll away. After a quick look, the Chosen One rolls back around, knocking into Master Pain. The confusion causes the minions to run away, but they both receive an iron claw in their back for their cowardice. There is a short lull in the action as Master Pain searches the darkened shack for trace of his opponent. However, a pair of quivering booties underneath the bed gives his position away. Master Pain unsheaths his katana, preparing to strike at the tiny feet, and the closing frame we see a blurry Master Pain as he's about to attack the Chosen One. Now, if it's really not apparent at this stage, this comedy, it's probably best to describe it as, say, absurdist. As in, nobody expects a baby to... <laughs> As stupid as it sounds to exclaim something like that, there are people that don't get absurdist humour and they take a lot of things like media that is blatantly silly very seriously or they will only like highbrow humour and they don't like lowbrow humour or something like that. From a critique point of view, this is a very important scene because basically this tells you what the movie you're going to get. Not necessarily all the plot and everything like that. Yeah, that's important, but this tells you what type of movie you're going to get. This is a movie where within the first four minutes you have a baby doing kung fu against three grown adults and holding his own. This is not meant to be taken seriously. I don't feel like I should point this out, but you be surprised. So it does form a very important part in this world building. It telegraphs to the audience, this is kind of silly and absurd and stupid, whatever you want to apply to those terms, but yeah, don't take this too seriously. To use a mystery science theater quote, just repeat to yourself, it's just a show and you should really just relax. Anyway, in this minute, we also first shown the CGI baby. Uh, I should probably state for the record, no babies were harmed in this movie. There was some rubber stunt babies in this, some puppets, and of course, that monstrosity. Okay, okay. So what we're going to be discussing here is the Uncanny Valley. Now, some people think this doesn't exist, but I'm going to be using it as a theoretical point to discuss this particular scene. Uh, this is regards to facsimiles. This is great when you want to discuss, say, movie monsters and the othering of people and stuff like that. So the further away it is from representative human, the more we disassociate it. So like a zombie, even though it's a humanoid, it's very non-human, so we don't have empathy for it, we don't associate with it, we automatically other it, and it's signified as bad, corrupt, even. Now as you get closer to being more recognisable human, that's when our empathy starts to get a little bit stronger. Let's say a fictitious character, Commander Data from Star Trek. He's very human presenting, but his skin tone and his eyes are very other. He's very much representative human. We know he's a android and we kind of accept it. But with CGI, it gets a bit wonky because as soon as you get closer to a human, it starts to drop. And that's the uncanny valley. It gets to a point where we just reject it. It looks fake. And the reason I'm going back to this now is we've got a really clearly fake baby on screen. Now, I have no proof of this, but it wouldn't surprise me if this particular CG model was directly inspired by the dancing baby meme. Now, the reason I say I don't have no proof of it, but the timeline could possibly match up. So about 1996, oh God, that's a long time ago now. So 1996, one of the very kind of first viral internet videos was this thing called Dancing Baby. It originated as a collection of experimental testing data and files, ultimately released in autumn of 1996 as a product sample source file, brackets, sk underscore baby dot max, brackets, 
with the 3D character animation software product Character Studio, used with 3D Studio Max, brackets both products from Kinetics slash Autodex brackets. It was a tool and someone rendered it out and popped up in and spread like wildfire. It didn't get mainstream recognition, however, until the TV series Adam McBeal started using it. Oh God, Adam McBeal, that was what, yeah, 1997. <laughs> wow, pretty much a generation since Adam McBeal was a big thing. So for those that don't know, if you've watched the future hour episode called with uh, the TV show Single Female Lawyer, that's Alan McBeal. And the, the dancing baby was a hallucination of some sort that she had. I didn't watch that many episodes. It was not my thing. But doing a little bit of research, it was usually accompanied by blue Swedes hooked on a feeling. Which is funny now that that's very much associated with Guardians of the Galaxy. And ironically, the first movie and not the second one with Baby Groot. There you go. Either way, the reason I bring this up is that it could possibly be the same model with some modifications to give it like darker hair based on the actual child in the scene, but like it's uncannily similar. They just probably added the extra booties and they probably darkened down the diaper to make it match, but without a shot by shot comparison, I reckon it's the same model. <laughs> But it would not actually make it relevant for the time this produced. This movie was released in 2002. It had a long time in post and pre-production. We'll get to that, I think, in the next episode, slightly. This movie took a while to make, so there is no doubt. If this movie was, say, being written as it was being sourced in, say, mid-90s, they probably saw The Dancing Baby and thought, we could use that. I don't think they probably would have developed a dancing baby. This was only a $10 million budget and a lot of the effects were done in-house. If Odekirk's people can get back to me, I'm happy to get the full story, but yeah. For now, I'll say it is probably directly inspired. The timeline just helps it. And we definitely have a cultural reference to 1999 later on in the movie. So we'll definitely get to that more back then. So the last thing I want to talk about is sound effects. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but um, there's a thing when it comes to sound mixing in media. I might get into this more a bit later on, but for now we'll, we'll take a, a shallow walk in the puddle that is like you know, really deep. Part of a media experience like this is, as much as the visuals, it's also sound. When I said about the gong in the previous episode, you know, how it doesn't really fit in the scene, but people accept it because it's part of that world. You don't question it. And this is one of the common ones that people tend to get a bit iffy about now because there's more knowledge about how wrong it is. But whenever a sh sword unsheaths, it doesn't make the metal ringing noise. <laughs> And this one does, especially katanas. For those that don't know, a katana's scabbard is typically wood. It may have a metal ring on the top. Really doesn't make that much sound. So I just happen to have a katana with me. I'm just going to unsheath it. So that initial metal bit there, that's, that's the metal on metal. But the rest of it, there's no, except that last bit there. There's no real metal sound. That's because it's mostly wood. How's that for a live demonstration, folks? My particular katana is um, a pirate katana from Pirates of the Caribbean. I think it's the one that um, the pirate lord has. I don't know, I got it cheap on uh, eBay a few years ago. That's a quick draw of a katana. You can also hear, that's pretty low. That's very silent. I'm actually having to hold this really close to the microphone. I'll do it one more time. So yeah, the long metal shing is a post added effect. The more you know. So let's go to the audio commentary. In this part, Steve is explaining some of the technical size of production. It's an amalgamation. We started with uh, the old footage. I wrote the script while I was looking at the old footage. 50% of the footage is new. And we, we rebuilt all of the original sets from the old film down in Mexico at uh, Fox Studios Baja, home of Char Charlie Arneson. What I would do is then I gave me the freedom. I body doubled all the actors, so I had the freedom to add anything within a scene that I wanted to add, uh, shoot new angles, uh, put myself into the old film. Okay, and now we get to one of my favorite parts, the what were they really saying moment. I must be nursed. I think he says, I must be nursed. I don't know, it's very obscure, because I, I even listening, I think, did he actually say the, the written? I don't know, but I think he said he must be nursed. We'll, we'll just assume it's that, knowing what happens to him. Whoa, yeah. Now we cut to the audiobook part. Kill it. So there you go, that's 
all there is for this particular minute. Thank you for listening. Please like, share, subscribe. I've, at the time of this recording, it's still very early days. I'm recording a bunch at a time. Well, I can. I've got a Facebook page now. It's facebook.com slash minute. Or you can find more of my work on Facebook slash Fanboy Crossing. YouTube, there's links down in the description. Please like the page, share along do all that other stuff. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing something. Yeah, I got Kofi. If you want to send me some money that way, a one-off payment, you know, I'm, any any little bit helps. I have now reactivated my Patreon. I kept saying that for three episodes, but now it's actually there. And yeah, I've just got a minimum $1 tier, which will get you early access to videos. I have got a bulk of these, so I'm going to upload them as much as possible in a short amount of time. So I've got a good backlog. And if you donate Tree Fitty, while I'm blathering over this, your name will be scrolling or on the page somewhere. I might have to do that in post if someone actually donates to the Patreon in the next two couple of weeks. That's going to be weird. And I also have a $10 pledge on Patreon if you want me to record me saying your voice in the end of this as a thank you. I can probably either do it in a silly voice. I, I don't know if I will or not. If you want to demand a silly voice, by all means. You know, maybe that's the $10 tier. Maybe for a $20 tier, I'll do it normally. If people ask for a $20 tier so I will speak their names properly, I will be shocked. But this is the internet, so it could happen. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll catch you next time. See ya.